We begin a new lesson this morning on uh, page 227, uh, lesson 45 in your books. You can turn there if you want to. We probably won't uh, be doing much there in the book, but um, anyway, that's what we're going to be starting. You can be, hopefully you've already read through that and um, be worried, working the activities there. We'll get to those before too much longer. We're going to be talking about teaching the next generation. We'll look at some passages today that will help us discuss that. And um, hopefully we'll be able to get some things that would be beneficial to us. If you would, let's bow and have a word of prayer as we begin. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this day. We're thankful for its beauty. We're especially thankful that it's the Lord's day that we can come together and to worship. We pray, Father, you'll be with us during this Bible study period, that we'll learn those things that would be helpful for us in our lives, help us to grow stronger and more dedicated to serving you. We pray, Father, that you will continue to bless us, especially those that we're aware of that need our prayers, that are struggling with their health or uh, losses in their lives or other difficulties that are causing them to struggle and stumble a little bit and we pray that we'll be able to encourage and uplift and let them know that we're there for them and we know that you will be there supporting them. Pray, Father, you continue to be with this congregation as we go forward with the activities that we have planned. That our purpose is always to be able to reach out and to present the gospel to someone and to encourage them to be obedient to it. We're thankful for our missionaries. We're thankful for the mission work. We pray that we'll continue to see good results. We know where the gospel is preached, that the seed is planted. And sometimes it may take several years, but we're so thankful for the results that come. We pray, Father, that there would be an awakening and a, a desire to hear the truth. So we live in a world that's full of false uh, news and false statements and those things that are unproven. We pray, Father, people open their eyes and ears and listen to the truth. We pray, Father, that you bless this nation, help us to head in the direction we need to go. We pray, Father, that we will head back and to have a God in our lives and in our schools and in our homes that we might be able to be the nation that we, we can be that we might recognize a true and living God. We pray, Father, that you'll forgive us of our shortcomings, help us to be stronger, help us uh, not to make excuses, but help us to uh, work every day to try to better ourselves. We might be the best servants we can be. We pray, Father, that you continue to keep us mindful of the blood of your Son, the sacrifice that he made, and what you were willing to do to give him up. We pray, Father, that we'll always be thankful, much gratitude in our hearts for what you've done for us. Continue with us this morning, throughout the days ahead, and watch over and care for us. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> All right, well, we have a pretty awesome task in talking about teaching the next generation. And um, we're going to look at a couple of passages but when you start talking about teaching the next generation, we're, we're about, um, at least from my perspective, we're, we're talking about a crisis that exists in the world today. And that, um, that doesn't just deal with the church, but of course we're going to talk about the scriptures and, and the church that's going to be our primary focus, but just in general in the world today, there's an abandonment of, uh, of teaching and teaching our children. We find that it's difficult, and uh, we don't necessarily see the results, and because of that, we'll shirk back or shrink from doing those things that uh, are necessary to, to keep things in order. And... Um, Man, the examples 
of discussing that. We could call so many to mind, and we'll try to, uh, if, if, if they come to my mind, at least I'll try to draw attention to them, but uh, there's been so many things of that. We've taken God out of the schools, and then yet we want to understand why is it that we have a reckless society? Why is it we have things that happen that are just unbelievable? We want to blame the fact that people are killed on the, the guns that are in the people's hands. But guns aren't the only thing killing people. Vehicles are killing people. Uh, baseball bats are killing people. Do we need to outlaw baseball bats? Uh, these are the things that are happening in our society because we have an unruly society. We have an uneducated, ungoverned society. And uh, so things like this happen. You go back a number of years, I would say 20 years or so, maybe longer than that, we never heard of these things happening. Now you can say, well, we have the internet now, we have instant news and, and whatever. It's out there for us to see and we didn't have that before. That's true. But statistically, there weren't these many things that were happening years ago. And so our abandonment of God in this country and our lack of teaching to our children and letting them govern themselves has brought us a society of chaos. Now, how do we get it back? Well, you have to start back doing those things that caused us to have rule and caused us to have uh, control over things. And you can't leave children unattended. You'd be surprised at the number of households that uh, would leave their children to their own education or their own use of time as opposed to ever teaching them anything. And the general, the, the general uh, philosophy of a lot of parents in the world today is not my job to teach the kids. Whose job is it? Well, it's the school. You know, and, and even in the church, there are people who think that it's the church's responsibility to train up my children. It's the church's responsibility to take care of them. It's the elders. I'm re recalling a story that happened probably 20 plus years ago of a lady that was a member of the church who was, was fretting about the direction that her young son was, and I guess he was a teenager at the time, just turned one or something was spreading in the direction that her son was going in and wanted the elders to talk to her child. Well, now they can talk to her child, but they're not the ones who are supposed to train and bring that child up. It's her responsibility and her husband's. Now, granted, there's so many problems out in the world today because in a lot of homes, it's a single-parent family. Uh, and either by abandonment or death or something along those lines, we have situations where... Uh, children are not getting the proper treatment. I remember uh, years and years and years ago uh, working the bus routes back when we were trying to get kids in the neighborhood to come to, to the services and, and you'd get to know the families because you would just, just because you, you drove by the neighborhood and picked the kids up, you'd begin to understand the family situation. And there were people who were mostly women that were bringing up their kids with no father. That's not to say the kids didn't have fathers. In a lot of cases, they didn't know who the father was or the father had abandoned them. And there are situations where the mother was working three jobs. Well, if you're working three jobs, you're never at home. And so what happens to your kids? They're either brought up by the neighbors next door or they're brought up on their own watching the television or they're brought up by people in games. And so you know why we have so many gangs and, and, and that today? Because we don't have homes. Now, it all boils down to us training and doing what we need to do. And uh, it's, it is an awesome task. It is a scary task. We are not in the place we need to be. Would you agree that the world we live in today is not a good place? Now, I'm not saying that you experience it personally, but in general, if we know the status of the world and things that are happening in the world, the world's not too good of a place to be in right now. 
and more and more keeps coming forward. Um, there's no suppression of people coming up and not hating things or hating people and taking uh, things in their own hands and, and causing violent activities to happen because things didn't go their way or they didn't get what they wanted. Those were curtailed in the home in the past. You suppress that kind of attitude. You don't live like that. You don't do these things. And it didn't have to be a godly home. When I say that, I mean someone who was strictly following some religious teaching. It could be in any general home. You didn't do the things that we do today. And yet they're happening. So we want to look at some things. And I want to start out in Joshua chapter 24. And uh, we'll look at a few passages this morning and discuss some things and, and we'll see how far along we've, we've gotten. And if you have anything to bring forward regarding this, just feel, feel free to speak up. If you look at Joshua um, 24 and verse, verse 15 is the first one we always we go to. But let's just let's start there. What did Joshua say? You know, the decision was you can follow the gods that were across the river in the land of Egypt. You can follow the gods in the land that, of who, whose land you now dwell. Or you can follow the true God. Now here's what Joshua said in Joshua 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the uh, Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now there's, there's the thing that we always go back to. We've had that for last leaders in the past. This particular verse. It's for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Now that's a statement that we're making. Now not only is Joshua just making a statement, but he's making a commitment. Now this is what we have to have in our families today. Our families, the heads of the family have to make commitments that they will serve the Lord. That's number one that, that we need to happen. That we're going to do that. And we're going to do it regardless of what comes and stum causes us to stumble on our path. We're going to always focus on serving the Lord. And we're going to do those things that the Bible teaches and we know that God will take care of everything else. We've got to have that commitment. So there's a responsibility right there with parents. If we're going to talk about teaching the next generation, it's going to have to start with the parents. And uh, they're going to have to stand up and choose whom they're going to serve. And if you don't choose to serve the Lord, you're going to serve, you're going to serve the devil, and you're going to serve chaos. And that's what we have in the world today, chaos. But it's interesting as you look at Joshua, and you understand the life that he lived. I always, I look at Joshua um, compared to people like David. David was someone that was... Um, you know, on fire for the Lord, but then he'd have problems. And we see those in his life. But Joshua, I I'm, I'm, can't call to mind, maybe you can, but I can't call to mind any time when Joshua was not faithfully serving God. When he was chosen as a spy, he went out and didn't shirk in his responsibilities, went out and came back with the report, yes, they're big, but our Lord can take care of them. Joshua and Caleb were able to stand up and say, we need to go into the land like God wants us to. Because even though they're big, God will help us. The other ten spies gave a bad report. And of course they suffered some <coughs> repercussions, Joshua and Caleb did, because they didn't go along with that report. I don't know of any time that Joshua didn't serve God. And so he closes out his life by saying, you can choose who you're going to serve, but for me and my house, and that's all I can speak for, we're going to serve the Lord. Now, that's the commitment that we need to have in our, in our homes, and we need to have with our leaders in our homes. And we need to make sure that we are consistent in, in carrying those out. Drop down to uh, verse 29. <clears throat> And we, we, of course, are dropping into a, the middle of something, but we'll just have to uh, get the pieces that we need out of it. Verse 29, It came to pass after these things that Joshua, the son of Nun, <clears throat> the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old. 
And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Timnath Sirah, which is in the Mount, which is in Mount Ephraim, on the north side of the hill of uh, Gaash. And Israel, this is the point I want to make to you, and Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua. Now when we look at the other passages, and definitely in the time of Judges, we see the problem that Israel had. And that is that Israel had problems serving God. But during the days of Joshua, all the days of Joshua, they served the Lord. That's a remarkable statement. Based on what Joshua had led them into and his conviction to serve the Lord. But he, he served him, the, the house of Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that it says overlived Joshua or outlived Joshua. So not only was Joshua influential in causing the children of Israel to be faithful to God, but the people that he um, had that were uh, his peers were faithful in following the same example that Joshua established. And during those days, uh, they all served the Lord. Now here's the sad part So we read on. So all the ones that uh, the elders that outlived Joshua and which had known all the works of the Lord that he had done for Israel. These were known. And uh, they said, remember Joshua. This is what Joshua did. This is what Joshua stood for. Because of Joshua's influence, we're going to serve the Lord. Now that's, that's a strong statement and a strong influence over so many people. Now the sad part as we continue on. Uh, in which had known all the works of the Lord that had, he had done for Israel. And the bones of, uh, of Joseph... Okay, I guess I haven't got to that part. Anyway, let's, let's leave it there in Joshua 31. The days of Joshua, he served the Lord. All those who outlived him served the Lord. All of Israel remembered the deeds he had done, and they stayed faithful to the Lord. Now, Judges chapter 2 and verse 10. Well, we're going to pick up a little bit earlier than that. Let's uh, go back to verse 8. Remember Joshua died, verse 29 of chapter 24 of Joshua, 110 years old. Pick back up with another passage discussing that. Judges 2, 8. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old. And they buried him in the, the border of his inheritance in timnath Heres, in the Mount of Ephraim on the north side of the hill Gash. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. So these people all died. And there arose another generation after them. That's nothing surprising. There's going to be a generation after them if, if time goes on. But look at what it says. Which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. Now how is it that generations happen? Okay, you look at this audience. There are several generations in here. But it doesn't come up to a, a point in time and one generation just disappears and the next generation starts, right? There's always overlap. And so how is it that you get to a point that the generation before you knew all about God, served God faithfully, and the next generation doesn't know God, doesn't know the things that happened and, uh, during that time that someone lived, and doesn't know anything about God. Now, I'm sure it wasn't a situation where if you were to brought up the, the name of God or talk about God, they'd say, oh, yeah, yeah. But what this is saying is this generation... Uh, didn't have any desire to serve the Lord. They didn't have any desire to do anything to follow after the ways of the previous generation. So what's one way that that happens? 
Why do we have so many atheists in the world today, especially among young people? They don't know who God is, do they? Who is God? We've taken God out of our, our schools and then we've allowed that to be uh, extended to our homes where we don't talk about God. We can't talk about God at school. Let's don't talk about him at home. And so there's no teaching that's going on. And there's a real problem in the world today. I, you know, we jokingly, and may not want to say this too loudly because there's probably some in the audience here, or I know there's some in the audience here. We talk about millennials. And if you look at people describing uh, uh, ages and groups of people, they, they, they identify them by different ages. And uh, they say, well, this is the, this group, and here's this group, and then we have the millennials. Uh, and, and not to, uh, to poke fun at, but there's generally a lack of teaching in the world today, especially in our homes. Well, first of all, when we start talking about Christian teaching and values, it has to begin in the home. That's going to be here by the pulpit and by Bible school teachers back in the classrooms. But I want to tell you something. If you are in touch with anybody that has to deal with some of our young people. And this is, this is not like young people are bad. This is just the way we are today. It's not a good situation, but the way we are. You go back in there and you start talking to some of the teachers that teach the younger kids. And you talk especially about the teenage class. You know how much they know about the Bible? It's appalling. Well, why is that the case? Why is it they don't know any more than, the, than they know? It's not only the fact that we aren't making sure that kids are being taught in the home, which is the primary responsibility. It's good to come here. It's good to have Bible school teachers. We want people to be here. But it's hard for those kids, they, in a lot of cases, quite frankly, they don't necessarily want to be here. And if we don't teach our kids to enjoy coming to Bible class and learning things, they'll come, but they won't listen. And they'll leave not knowing anything. But if you go back there right now and you get the elementary things in the Bible and you go to start talking to them and asking them questions, they don't know the answers. So why is that? Because we're not teaching. And um, even if you can teach and you're teaching in the classrooms, you usually get a non-responsiveness. You'd almost want to ask the question, are you awake? Because... This just like looking at a statue. I know there's difficulties in our lives. I know that it's not always easy to, to stay, find the time at home to teach our kids, but it must happen there. That's the bedrock of teaching and bringing about the education of our kids. It's got to begin there. And then others can try to help. But we have to instill in them a hunger and a desire to know the truth. To let them know that it's important for us to know about the Bible and about God. And not treat it as just something that we do. If we treat coming and serving and, and, and trying to learn about God as, well, I have to go to church today. We use that terminology. First of all, the church is not this building the church are the members that make up this congregation and throughout the world. That's the church. And so we try to uh, get conveyed across. We've always had this discussion with our kids growing up. You don't have to go to church. You get to go to church. It is a privilege to be able to come here. And especially to come and be uh, unencumbered by the outside influences of the world 
and come to a place where we can come and study God's Word. But we have to make it important in our homes. It's got to be above all these other things that are happening. Our sports activities, our extracurricular school activities, playing, uh, entertainment, whatever, it's got to be above all that. And if we don't make that message clear, we're not going to be able to reach our kids. The idea that a generation that follows one generation does not know about God is very troubling. You know? But here's the thing about it. If we teach our children, and we're strong about teaching our children uh, about God and the Bible and making sure they understand the importance of it, but our children don't pass it on, then that next generation has no clue. And I've seen it in families and uh, had people I've been associated with where that's been the case. Their parents were very faithful. They just didn't, didn't, they didn't like it. They rebelled against it for some reason. They felt like they were being choked. And they will not set foot in a church building to even hear about the truth of the gospel. They don't care. Now, what happens when they have children? They're not going close to any place that teaches about the truth. So the idea is that this is a perpetual thing that we have to overcome by continuing to teach and teach the importance of what we're doing and give them the understanding of why we do what we do. Don't just say because I said so, but do it because of what the Scripture tells us, of what God has done for us. How without God we're in a world of chaos and there's no future for anybody in this world, in, in their mind at least, other than to live it up and then I'll die and then it'll be over with. Now, you don't think that's a mentality of most people? Go talk to them. I find that every day. Well, I'll go do what I want to and I'll just, I mean, I'm here for this job so I can get the money. I'm not really trying to go anywhere, but I'm going to go out and I'm going to do what I want to do and have a lot of fun. One of these days I'm just going to die. And that's the way they view the world. Teach the kids to understand who God is, why we're here, what our purpose is, where we're trying to go, and why it's important for us to know God's will and to carry it out. And uh, not teach it to them as a drudgery. Well, we have to go to church today. I, I'm right in the middle of something. I'd like to just sort of uh, not have to fool with it going to church. And so that's the attitude I convey to my kids. Dad, it's time to go to church. Okay, you know, I'll go clean up or whatever and we'll go to church. And if we have that kind of mentality, our kids are going to grow up with that, well, it's just an inconvenience to go to church. And when you get to a teenage year and you're like, your parents are making me come to church and you've been brought up thinking that it's, well, it's an inconvenience, you don't care if you learn anything or not. So we have to do something that's better. Now, what are we supposed to do? Deuteronomy 6. Let's turn over there. Deuteronomy chapter 6. <clears throat> Verse 3. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers has promised thee, in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Well, obviously we're talking about the children of Israel. We're talking about them going into the land of, of promise, and the land that flow with milk and honey. But God is telling them, here through Moses, to make sure that they observe what they're doing. Now, what's he going to do? Observe it, do it. It's a commandment, okay? Uh, why are you going to do it? Because it's going to be well with thee. You're going to do well if you listen to God. God's going to take care of you. And that you may increase mildly, as the Lord, the God of thy fathers, has promised. Now, if we serve God, we go to New Testament uh, teachings that Jesus himself 
said, if, if you'll follow after me, you'll have uh, a more abundant life than the life that you now hear upon the earth and then the life to come. Uh, there's going to be a lot of blessings in serving God. We need to teach our kids that that's the way it is. God's going to bless us. Now, we live in a difficult world because we, li we deal with, with Satan. We've got a lesson about the devil down the road a few weeks from now. And we'll talk about some of these things. But, strong influence, strong teacher. You think that Satan ever rests? No, he doesn't ever rest. And he's over here saying, well, look, if you don't serve God, you can have all these things that are, you know, that you'd like to have too. And so, you have to make that choice. You know, what's the benefits? What he doesn't tell you about are the consequences of all the things that are supposed to be so enjoyable uh, and so desirable. He didn't tell you about the consequences. The Lord, on the other hand, promised to bless us and those things that we have need of and, and in our lives. And there's, they're long-lasting blessings. They're blessings that are everlasting, that lead to everlasting life. And so it's hard sometimes for our kids to see the difference. We have to point that out to them. And there's a, there are plenty of things. There are so many things that uh, we can make them aware of now. You can see the consequences of people's actions in today's world in terms of I'm going to go do this thing that makes me have fun and then we see the results. People who are winding up out of control behind the wheel, the steering wheel of a car and mowing over people to the death. They had fun, but now they're not having fun. And there's so many stories like that of how uh, Satan is going to try to say that if you follow after me as opposed to God, I'm going to give you a lot more fun. But he doesn't talk about the consequences. It is. Because think of all these people whose children are not following God. The heartache, the grief that comes from those children. There's so much pain in that. And then as they follow God, it's going to follow in the generations. It's going to continually be a blessing, just like it's saying. If, if you can convey to your children and get rid of all the smoke that Satan's going to put out there and, and everything else this world's going to toss at us. And if you can get them to comprehend the relationship with God and His Son, and they get that, they get it, they're going to teach it to their, their, their kids. But if we don't do a good job of teaching that, if we teach that church is all about forcing ourselves to go do something we don't want to do, if that's the way that's viewed. If they view us as adults, that that's what you're doing. You're, you're going through that, and you don't really enjoy it. Well, guess what? They're going to view that and read you, and they're going to say, well, it's not important, or it is a pain to go through, so I don't want to do it. When we can teach our kids the truth, get them to understand the relationship that they should have with God and His Son, and what he does for us, what he's done for us, and what he continues to do for us. If we can get that message across to our kids, then we can be, be uh, confident that they're going to teach the next generation also. But if we don't get that instilled, and we instill in them it is a cumbersome, um, forced uh, support and service to God, and we have to do it, and it's just a burden. That's what they're going to read from us. And that's what they're going to, where they're going to stop it. And they say, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do what my parents did. And so we have to understand that there's such a difference there. And we have got to be careful what we convey to our kids. If we convey to our kids that church is, is burdensome, it's boring, and we just have to do it, they won't do it. And so we need to understand that... Um, what needs to be done?
But there's benefits, God says, in you obeying me. Uh, verse verse uh, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. That's where they've got to be. If they're not in your heart, then they're, they're not going to do any good. They're not going to produce, produce any fruit. If we don't get the Word of God in our hearts, where that we understand it, we comprehend it, and we should then be able to explain it to our children and those round about us, we're not going to have the results we need to have. You can't take a salesman. If you've ever seen one like this, I've seen it at least displayed on uh, maybe a movie or some um, TV show or something where the salesman comes up and says, basically, you don't want this, do you? Now, that's not going to sell very good, right? If you, go, you approach someone like that, well, you really don't want this, do you? But I'd like for you to buy one because I, I, you know, I need to make some sales. Chances are we're not going to do too good. If he comes up and says, this product works, he, he believes in it wholeheartedly. If he says, I use it myself, people I know use it, it works every time, it's simple. How many times do you think people are going to buy that? They're probably going to buy it because of, of his old approach. Well, if we convey the gospel as it has done so much for our lives and it continues to do so much for our lives and there's nothing like it in comparison and that we want other people to share in the, the blessings that come from serving God and we talk about it in such a positive way, our children will pick up on that if we're not hypocritical. Our friends and neighbors will pick up on that and we'll be able to reach people. We can teach them because it's something that they're interested in. Our kids back here need to be interested. We need to present the teachings of the Bible in such a way that it's interesting to them. And they want to, so to soak that up. And they don't need to look at it as a burden to be here. Um, I don't know if you've ever experienced that in any kind of activities, but... Um, if you're involved in something that's going on and you have some people there that just don't want to be there, what's generally your attitude if you're organizing that or you're the one running that? You just as soon as they not be here, right? Because you have to deal with that attitude. Well, how do you think God feels when we come in here to worship Him when we really don't want to be here? Well, if God looks down upon us and God knows all, He knows that. He reads us. Well, guess what? Your kids read you too. And if you don't want to be somewhere and it's a burden for you, they're not going to pick up on it. Now, that's the idea that's happening here in, in Israel after the death of Joshua and the elders that li have lived after him. It wasn't the fact that all of a sudden there was nothing in the land to, to give them knowledge about the, the God of Israel and what had been done but they weren't talking about it. It didn't mean anything to them. If you have, let's just say for example, uh, I don't know how many of you lived during the Great Depression. It's probably getting to be very limited. There may be some in here that have. But maybe at least the effects of the Great Depression. Now, if you lived in that era or your parents lived in that era, you tend to be very careful about throwing anything away, right? Why? Because you might be able to use it. And if you don't have anything, you're looking for things that you can use, right? So you're, you don't throw things away. And what's the, the, the take on most of the people in the world today if they see something like that? That's a piece of junk. Get rid of it, Right? And I sort of leaned toward that way until the American pickers came along. And now I'm beginning to believe we should not have thrown some of that stuff away. But you, you see the point I'm making? If you lived in a time when you were without food and you were without things, 
then you, you, you dealt with it the best way you could. And you, you, maybe you hoarded some things or you stockpiled. You know, if you had a, a garden and you were able to get produce, you didn't throw anything away. And so that's what we need to understand. The, the children of Israel didn't appreciate the battles that Joshua had been through after the elders died off. They didn't appreciate coming out of the land of bondage and being blessed by God and carried through the wilderness and into the promised land. And the victories that God gave because they were faithful to serve him. They didn't know anything about that. And if they weren't being told about that and told in such a way that it was um, encouraging to those people and for them to understand what God was doing for them and how that God's going to continue to do that with them if they're faithful, it didn't mean anything to them. And so we have to understand that. And so he says, I want you to love the Lord your God and do it in your heart. I want these things in your heart. That means you're thinking about them constantly. I want you to have a, a place for them to where you protect them, where you have a ready recollection of them, and you know why it is that you're serving God and the things that you've been through. And so he says, I want you to hold on to these. Now, not only were they supposed to do that, but verse 7, And thou shalt teach them diligently unto your children. You're not going to come up here to, uh, to uh, a, a young child and say, uh, <clears throat> let's say, uh, just give him a general Israel name, David. Let's just use David. Not David the king, but just David as a general Israelite name. David, let me tell you about the time that we went to war with or had the battle to get something to happen. And you tell David about that once every five years. David's going to say, yeah, okay. I think I've heard this before. And it's not going to mean much to him. The idea here that God through Moses is trying to convey to the children of Israel is you have been through some very trying, difficult times, and I have led you through every one of them. And I want you to teach these things diligently to your children. And when he means diligently, he's going to go on and tell us, as we read on here in Deuteronomy chapter 6, what that entails, what he means by that. Have you... Um, I have this situation come up in, in my life and uh, <clears throat> there'll be times when kids would come with the, you know, they're okay, they're doing okay in school, not too bad. All of a sudden they come up and they say, Dad, I'm really having problems with something to do with math. Okay? And so it's like, here, I need some help with this. Well, if it's arithmetic, subtraction, well, even that is not very easy now. Because you have to know this way to do it. Like, well, you just do this right here. No, you can't do it that way. You've got to do it this way. Now, these new educational ways, are they're great. It's just funny how adults can't figure them out. But if they came to you with something that was maybe an, al an algebra problem, and they just all of a sudden said, and, and I've had this happen. The kids come in, I need some help with this tonight. We've got to do, turn this in the assignment in tomorrow. Well, give me a minute. I mean, you know, it's not like I've got it instantly right here. It's in the back of my head. It's got to come to the front of my head. And so I'll have to think about it. Well, I mean, I just never mind. Never mind. I just got to get it done. Well, give me a second, you know. It's not right there. Well, see, that's because I'm not studying algebra all the time. It's not right there in the forefront of my mind. I haven't been diligent about algebra. If I had, I'd say, okay, there it is right there, not a problem. But I've got to get some of that rust off. Now, if we're serving God and we have to get the rust off, and you know, we're going to be teaching our kids 
and it's going to be on a, such a casual period of time basis, I've got to refresh. Well, that's not, if, if, I go, if they go to, to serving God and they say, well, say, what, what about this? And you say, well, I don't know. Let me think about it. If it's not right there on their hearts, if it's not on their minds, it's not in the right place when it comes to serving God. And we can't have that. We've got to diligently teach them. It means it's got to always be there. And it's got to be presented to them on a very regular basis. We'll talk about that some more next week. Thanks for being here. I'll have to let you go. That's bell number two.